Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Good evening. Uh, my name is Don Taylor. I am on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin School for Workers. I'm also on the steering committee of the Haven Center. Uh, and I am up here in front of you tonight to introduce Stanley Aronowitz. Uh, Stanley's a distinguished professor of sociology and urban education at the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, a former steel worker and union organizer. He's the author or editor of 27 books and over 200 articles. Uh, one of his most recent books, uh, which is the connection to our, our event tonight, uh, is a book called The Death and Life of American Labor Toward a New Workers' Movement. Uh, his talk tonight is titled The Politics of Subjectivity and the Future of the Labor Movement. And with that, I give you Stanley Arano. Just give me a second. as a security blanket. And uh, you probably, some of you may wonder why I am titling my talk the Politics of Subjectivity. What is subjectivity? And in order to be able to answer that question, and I assume that many of you have extensive union experience or labor experience or work experience, subjectivity is not simply an individual problem or an individual trait. People do have subjectivity. That is to say, what is their perception of the world within which they live? What is their perception of the social structure? What is their perception of the politics? That's obviously a very important part of subjectivity. But there's a collective subjectivity, which is really much more complex and politically relevant. And to give you a, an example of that subjectivity, I'm going to take um, as an illustration <coughs> the recent rejection by 36,000 Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler workers of a contract negotiated by the union. Um, as you know, in the automobile industry, Ford, Fiat Chrysler, and General Motors now have a two-tier system. And the two-tier system was introduced in the wake of the Depression, which, by the way, is still going on, and notwithstanding what the newspapers and the media, including the social media, actually talk about. Uh, it was, in the case of Fiat Chrysler, it was a um, attempt to save the company from extinction. Um, in the case of General Motors, they were facing bankruptcy, and in the case of Ford, well, I have to say this, Ford is Ford. They were not going to be left behind. They were making money even during the, de the Depression, and they were not going to be left behind, so they demanded of the union that if he did it for General Motors and he did it for Fiat Chrysler, for Chrysler, you, you have to do it for us as well. But in the, the automobile industry in 2014 and early 2015 had a banner year. Doesn't mean the economy is all that much better. But it does mean that, that that car production and car consumption has dramatically improved. And the company made a lot of money in 2014 and 2013. And so the workers demanded the end of the two-tier system. Some of them actually expected that what they would go back to is the agreement that was made that had been entirely viol uh, violated to limit the second tier to 25% of the labor force. The union negotiators went to the uh, bargaining table and uh, failed, A, to eliminate the two-tier system, and to, B, did not have any real enforcement of the 25% limit on fair Chrysler. Um, 
it came away from the bargaining table and submitted the contract to their membership and 75% of the membership turned it down. That was a new subjectivity. In the first place, they hadn't had a strike in 30 years. They hadn't turned down the contract in 30 years. And now that they suddenly turned down the contract. That was, a, that was a change collectively in the subjectivity of the members, which meant they no longer perceived that they had to make concessions in order to be able to um, uh, save the company, or, or for that matter, in order to be able to uh, uh, maintain their dignity. But the union did not insist on that kind of a, uh, of, of a deal. And so there was, there developed in fair Chrysler a gap between the national union and the and the Chrysler workers. And um, there's been other cases around the country of a much smaller uh, scope. But that's what I mean by subjectivity, at least in the labor context, which is what, what are people's expectations? What are they willing to settle for? What do they see as their possibilities? Under, and under what circumstances? Subjectivity is never simply a psycho logical phenomenon, although it has psychological um, dimensions, but it's also as how people actually experience their lives in relationship to what they see around them. And when, they, when you have that kind of a situation, you might find in the history of the labor movement as well as the history of other social movements that things change, that subjectivity changes. It doesn't stay the same. People have different expectations. People have different perspectives. Uh, I could go into the history of the Chrysler Union. So they had a in local three, the Plymouth, the, the local seven, the Dodge locals were very, very different locals than a lot of the GM locals. GM was a, I won't call it a company union. It wasn't entirely a company union, but it was as close to a, pro, a very close relationship to the company, even under the peerless leadership of Walter Luther. Uh, it was not the same as Ford, it was not the same as Chrysler, but there was a long period where the economic situation in not just the auto industry, but the economic situation in the country had fundamentally changed. And what changed was there was a massive deindustrialization of manufacturing. Everybody knows that. And Good jobs were hard to find. People often could not find jobs in the areas that they, that they used to work in. Akron, for example, the whole industry of rubber was decimated, to give you an example. I worked in the steel industry when there were 600,000 steel workers in the United States. There were less than 100,000 steel workers left, including steel fabricating. One sixth produced the same tonnage as they did with 600,000 in 1960 and 1965. Basic oxygen processes, other technological processes changed the situation in the steel industry. Under those circumstances, one of the great weapons of capital was foisted upon the working class. Fear. Fear eats the soul. Fear makes people more conservative. Fear becomes, in many ways, both at the level of fantasy and the level of reality, a way that people begin to perceive their own uh, future in their own situation. Now, I'm not going to talk extensively about the decline of American manufacturing. I just wanted to give that as an, ex as an example of what I mean by subjectivity. Here in Madison, you had a shift in subjectivity in 2011, which I don't have to go into great detail with you, but there's one thing that I would simply comment on. 
in 2011, perhaps for the first time in decades, with the exception of Occupy Wall Street, which I'll get to a little bit later, union members responded to a wholesale attack by a governor and his administration on collective bargaining not primarily by legal action, and at first not primarily by legislative action, but by direct action. That was a fundamental shift in subjectivity. Now, there's no permanent shifts of any, any kind. It wasn't long before the entire country understood that something new would happen in Madison, Wisconsin. But through a series of circumstances, which you can, you, you, we can talk about, the struggle shifted from direct action to a recall movement to get rid of the gov governor and the legislature to start the Republican legislators who, who passed the law limiting collective bargaining to wages and other onerous features. It shows how fragile, fragile shifts of that kind are unless they are reinforced. There was a proposal that was drafted, and I'm not going to go into it, for a general strike in Madison. That was withdrawn. A committee was formed. And that was withdrawn. Now, to be, to be sure, the fight in Madison, and to a certain extent the fight in Chrysler, have one thing in common. They were defending, essentially, the status quo. There's people in Chrysler wanted to restore what used to be a relatively um, ironclad law of the labor movement. What was the ironclad law of the labor movement? Equal pay for equal work. This second tier in Chrysler was not <coughs> doing different work than people who were making the, the, the rate of the contract, the original rate. They were doing the same job. When you have a, a workforce that has two tiers of two people working next to each other and they make five or six or seven dollars an hour more or less, that's not a good that's not a good thing for unionism. You can't maintain solidarity under those circumstances, even though solidarity forever is the official soul of the United Automobile Workers. I want to just Now, outline, <clears throat> and by the way, in my book, and I'm not selling my book, we have no copies here. In my book, Death and Life of American Labor, I rehearsed the Madison situation pretty extensively. So you may read my analysis, and you'll find out that I'm mostly wrong. When I say wrong, you know it better than I do, but. I was taking it from the point of view of its consequences, its implications, mostly. I want to, I want to offer a set of propositions to start with after that introduction about what it is that might characterize an effective fight back of the wholesale attack that's taking place against organized labor and working people in this country by large corporate interests, and I know you all know about that. There are three steps, and they're not necessarily steps that go uh, consecutively, but there are three different ways of proceeding. The first way of proceeding, and the one that I think the labor movement as well as other social movements have shown their ability to actually 
conduct with some degree of uh, force is called protest. You protest what the adversary has not only proposed, but has implemented, often implemented unilaterally without consultation. Protest, for example, against the uh, denial of collective bargaining. What's interesting about that, by the way, is denial of collective bargaining took place before Madison. It took place in Indiana, and it did not elect, elicit that kind of protest. So that's what I mean by the shift of subjectivity in one place, and not the shift of, subject, shift of subjectivity in places like Indiana. And in Michigan, it didn't have the same impact when they en en enacted the right to work law. The second one, and you know what that is, you go on marches, you demonstrate in front of the company or the, or the uh, city hall or the state legislature or whatever. The second one, which is the one that we still haven't gotten a generalized understanding of, is resistance. Last Thursday, my union, I'm a member of the United, uh, of the American Federation of Teachers at City University of New York, which is a faculty and staff union, and it ain't a small union, by the way, it's 23,000 people. We haven't had a raise in five years. Last Thursday, a thousand people showed up in front of the chancellor of the City University's home. on East 65th Street in uh, Manhattan. That's an example of protest. And it was very effective in consolidating people's anger because, um, uh, and of course this is, you know, this is something that we're gonna have to talk about at this meeting tonight because it was, because the, 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 we have to negotiate both with the mayor of the city of New York and his administration, and we have to negotiate with the governor of the state of New York, because City University of New York is a state institution administered by the city. We only have 250,000 students, <clears throat> the size of Madison, roughly, as, as a city. And we have 12,000 adjuncts, 6,700 no, 6, to 7,000 full-time faculty. Most of the teaching is done by adjuncts. We have a staff of administrators, uh, low-level administrators of 2,000. We have continuing education. We're a pretty big union, relatively speaking. In New York, not so big, but not so small either. The state law in New York State forbids public employees from going on strike. It's called the Taylor Law. And if you recall December 2005, those of you who have uh, uh, some taste for ancient history, the Transport Workers Union Local 100, which is the uh, subway and bus drivers, subway workers and bus drivers, went on strike for three days. They were ordered back to work, they collapsed, the president went to jail for five days, supposed to go to jail for 15 days, they let him out of there after five. And they were, they were deprived of a checkoff, they were deprived of automatic um, um, checkoff of, of, of union dues, and they were fined pretty heavily. Organized labor in New York City we have a few members in New York City in the Central Labor Council. I met with the uh, president of the Central Labor Council subsequently. I got to know him. 750,000 members in the unions. They had a rally, protest. They did nothing else when the union was fined, when the, when the president went to jail, when they lost their checkoff and so on. Just a robbery. And they made brave speeches. So the first point is protest is necessary but not sufficient. There was no indication of resistance. No indication of resistance such as you had in Madison, which was that you occupied 
big state capital. They didn't occupy anything. They simply had a rally. And everybody went on record. Resistance is when you have basically disrupted business as usual. When you block the streets, when you take over public property, when you occupy the offices of leading politicians who are responsible for the act of, um, of, um, uh, of jailing or the act of taking away the, um, the collective bargaining of people. Resistance is when you violate the law. You, uh, you, you undertake acts of civil disobedience. Public employees can, would, if, in, in New York State, if they uh, have civil disobedience, they'll lose their treasury maybe. I want to say parenthetically, we had a rank and file movement. We took over the union. I became the um, a member of the executive council. I was on the negotiating committee for nine years. This was before all this crap of, of no raises and of nothing. And during the entire period that I actually was sat on the, on the executive council and was on the negotiating committee, I asked our membership, but I also asked our leadership to um, consider issues of resistance when we didn't get what we needed. For example, equity for adjuncts as compared to full-time people based on um, um, per, per capita uh, teaching loads, or close to it, or some kind of movement towards it, nothing. Oh, Sam, you can't do that because the full-timers will get upset. And my attitude was, fuck the full-timers. I'm a full-timer. If, if you don't have equity for adjuncts, you're going to bring down the entire wage scale. You're going to bring down the benefit. You're going to bring down everything. We made some small gains. We did. But in fact, we made no real moves because to make real moves would have taken resistance. Illegal acts by by uh, by an illegal law. Resistance is very difficult from the point of view of subjectivity. Why? Because it means that people have to give up that which they have been trained and educated. And, and believe is the real way, that the rule of law is the best way to make progress. Even though the laws in the United States on labor relations have never been right, even the National Labor Relations Act, I rehearsed that in this book. I see somebody's got a copy of the book, God bless you. <laughs> the law of labor relations restricts labor's rights. It establishes a legal framework for the, for the uh, establishment of bargaining units. The law of labor relations at the state level have always limited, in many cases anyway, have limited public employees' right to strike and public employees' rights in many other ways. The deal is always we'll give you your recognition in return for which we will have control over the character of labor relations, of, of industrial labor relations. But we have been trained. I'm not saying you have been trained or anybody. I have been trained. I grew up in this, as well as everybody else. The contract is sacred. We obey the contract. We obey the law. We go on strike only after the expiration of the agreement. We don't, we, we, if we have any rights for, to strike, they're very limited within the context of the agreement. The auto, auto workers can strike over building up of grievances that don't get resolved, and they can strike over unfair labor practices. There's a whole variety of reasons that they can strike. Most unions don't even have that in the contract. And then we learn the second thing, that we have to have contracts. And I'm not so sure. In fact, in this book I said, if you need a contract, because it's forced on you, because the membership wants a contract, the contract should be limited to one year. 
economic conditions change, worker sensibilities or subjectivities change. You don't want to tie yourself to four and five year contracts. The UAW contract with Fiat Chrysler is a four year contract. It's outrageous. Even Walter Ruther, with all of his warts, and I can go into that at any time you want, uh, even Walter Ruther never would have signed a four year contract. He couldn't have done it at the time because the membership wouldn't have tolerated it. He tried a five year contract in 1950. And wildcat strikes made it impossible for him to do that anymore. Between 50 and 55, there were more wildcat strikes in the auto industry than ever had been in the history of the automobile um, situation. Anyway, so resistance. Now, even though resistance is a militant strategy or tactic to, to um, overcome injustice, it's necessary but not sufficient. There's a third element of a successful struggle which I'm going to propose tonight that you may find difficult. And it's called alternative. We're going to be in a position, given the situation that is taking place in the United States today, and it's spreading to other parts of the world as well, but especially in the United States, we're going to be in the position of having to invent, reinvent unions without contracts. I'm not saying everybody's going to not have a contract. That's not, that would be foolish. In fact, it would be wrong. But lots of workers won't be able to sign contracts, either because the law will prohibit them from doing so or because the employer resistance will be such that they won't be able to do it, or a third factor. The third factor is a lot of workers are being hired as contractors. They're workers, but they're hired as contractors, as, as small shopkeepers. My son-in-law is a filmmaker. Not a filmmaker, he's a would-be filmmaker. So what he does is he works in the film industry as a production assistant. And what we used to call in the steel industry a buggy lugger. Namely, he drives a truck carrying equipment from New Jersey to New York. New Jersey is where the equipment places, the warehouses are, to New York. And he also, he also helps around the, um, around the, uh, the, the independent film industry in New York uh, in a production situation. Every time the, the job is over, he's unemployed again. He has to look for another job. But he's called the heat, but he's a contractor. So the, we have to reinvent these things. Where do I get my information from? Not from my own head, but from the, but from the fact that in New York City, we have an organization called the Taxi Workers Alliance. It has 16,000 taxi drivers as its members, mostly immigrants. It doesn't have a contract because they are considered independent contractors. The companies no longer hire anybody. They require people to pay money and you have to own your own car. Or if you, or if you drive the cab, you have to either buy the cab or, cab or pay monthly fees to be able to drive it. But it's a union. And whenever the union needs something, they block JFK. They block LaGuardia Airport. They block even Newark, by the way, airport. Liberty Airport, they block it. If they have to, they, they, that's what they do. That's how they make their, their, their fight, through direct action. But it's resistant. Alternative means that there may have to be new forms of unionism. That the contract itself, may, we may realize that the contract itself is no guarantee of anything. And in fact, I think it's a trap. Because in most cases, it has a no, a no strike provision over the life of the agreement. 98% of, 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 of non-construction workers' uh, contracts have no strike agreements for the life of the agreement. So if you have a four-year contract or three-year contract, you can't strike even if the grievance is a pilot. 
We have to invent new, new, new ways because we have a whole new labor force. We have college educated people, people with bachelor's degrees, some of them with master's degrees, who can't find regular jobs. They have to become entrepreneurs in order to work. They're freelance. The whole freelance phenomenon, which used to be essentially a, a product of, of writers or artists or filmmakers and so on, the whole freelance phenomenon has now become more generalized. Not to say that it's anywhere near 50%. It's probably now about 20% people. The official figure is about 15%. And we have, so we have to reinvent unionism. <clears throat> That's an alternative. We have to think seriously that when workers are unemployed, that the government may not be available for unemployment compensation in some states. Or the unemployment compensation that is being offered will not be enough for people to live on. You know what the unemployment compensation is in New York State? I mean, very high, <coughs> very high uh, 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 price state. Four hundred bucks a week. It's ten dollars an hour. Obama thinks it's a living wage. General thinks it's a living wage. In New Jersey, it's $500 a week. I'm pointing to him because he knows something about Newark. But it's still not enough. I mean, the problem is that, so what, what are the options? One option would be union-sponsored workers' co-ops on all sorts of levels. Consumer co-ops, producers' co-ops, Union spun, one of the things I raised in this book is, and I don't know about Madison, but places like New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago and Detroit and so on, maybe not Detroit so much anymore, but certainly New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, Washington, the housing shortage for working people is dire. And I tell a story in this book, which I'm going to tell you. When I was 18 years old and got suspended from Brooklyn College, I decided not to go back to school. I was not expelled, I was suspended. I decided not to go back to Brooklyn College because I found, first thing I found, all the courses boring. And the second thing is, we had a president and an administration that was a McCarthyite president and I wasn't interested. So my father, said to me, if you don't go back to school, you leave the house. I left, 18 years old. That was it. I moved in with a, with a, with a, a friend, and uh, I worked in factories, and I moved to New Jersey, got married, all that. But what was, what was interesting is that my parents, before I left, had already gotten an apartment in a North Bronx housing development called the Amalgamated Houses. The Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America had established a housing complex of 10,000 units, 10,000 units, at affordable rates. And they paid a lot of money, and it was a co-op, and the co-op it was 19, whatever it was, the early 50s. The co-op had a high price to, to buy in, $3,000 for a two-bedroom apartment. And a lot of workers, especially skilled workers, bought apartments. The electrical workers, the IBEW, followed up with Electchester in Queens. And then the ILGW did it later on in 1960, in Penn South. My, mo my mother and father lived in this two-bedroom apartment. I was supposed to be in the second bedroom, by the way. For altogether between 
that place in North Bronx, and, and um, after my father died, my mother moved to, um, to uh, um, Penn South, which is 25th Street and 9th Avenue. She had a one-bedroom apartment. They lived there all together for 45 years. And when my mother died, what, ten years, eight years before my mother died, I started to pay a lot of her, her bills because she was debilitated. Her rent was $500, Ninth Avenue and 25th Street. And when she died, my, my daughter, who was her heir, collected $13,000, which was the interest on her original investment. Why haven't the unions taken housing of their membership seriously? Now, I want to say very clearly, the shop floor is the beginning of labor movement. And it's, not, it's irreplaceable. You have to have a struggle at the shop floor. You have to fight against speed up. You've got to fight against unfair labor practices by employers. You've got to do all, all that stuff. But people have two ma three major concerns, in my opinion. One of those major concerns is housing in, in, in many cities. The second major concern is education. In New York City, it's hard to get a decent education if you go, if you, if you go to public school. It's also true in Chicago. It's also true in any larger city. I don't know about Madison. But you don't have to be talented and all that kind of stuff to get into a decent school when I was a kid. Now it is. But you can't go to you. Now, education may not be important to most people, but I think it's important to only a few of them, parents. Parents care about education. Kids care about education. And the labor movement is silent about education, about schooling.